think of Satan's birth in the Old Testament. During the period between the Testaments, this is where he hits his adolescence, if you will. And then when we hit the New Testament, this is where he is a, the titan of evil. He is a for, fully formed adult. And this is the apocalyptic story, and its central narrative is the conspiracy theory of Satan and his demons out there messing with humanity behind every bush and around every corner. The concept of struggle between good and evil becomes a central motif in many of the ancient religious texts. And ultimately, the message becomes the forces of good will win out. The, um, the ultimate message is that in the end, righteousness will win out. God will triumph over evil. Remember that apocalyptic literature is addressed to an audience who is undergoing some type of persecution or they're suffering. It is the literature of crisis. The apocalyptic texts of the ancient Jews had also prophesied the arrival of a savior. A figure sent by God to guide the faithful and combat the forces of evil. The word Messiah, Hebrew Mashiach, means anointed. The Greek equivalent is Christos, known to us as Christ. It was a term used especially for the king, but it also gets to have a metaphorical uh, way of designating somebody as the Lord's elected one. And that's where we get the idea of a messianic savior who will one day come at the behest of heaven to save the suffering humanity on earth. The ancient writings of Jews, Christians, and Muslims all share the idea of a divine emissary to lead the charge in the battle against evil. The Christian scripture says, Satan will boldly up the ante, taking on God in the form of his earthly incarnation, Jesus Christ. To some, this sets Satan and God on a path of no return, an unstoppable course leading to the final battle. And this story then, the earthly embodiment of goodness, the earthly embodiment of evil, this story of their daily combat for the souls of humans is going to be the story that animates people's lives for centuries. history, Satan has been portrayed as a tempter of man, using it as a means to taunt God and draw him towards a final battle. One example is viewed as the most brazen. In it, Satan targets the human embodiment of God. his son, Jesus Christ. The early apocalyptic writings spoke of a Messiah, a savior chosen by God who would enter the holy city of Jerusalem and prepare the faithful for the battle with Satan. Those first Christians were essentially Jews uh, who had embraced the very simple idea that distinguishes Judaism from Christianity, the idea that the long-promised Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. Some viewed Christ as that savior. The New Testament is where the concept that Jesus Christ is both human and divine develops. For the Christians, Jesus represented a very human face for God. And that combination of power and vulnerability was 
so intriguing and so unique. Jesus is this vivid, earthly representation of God. Satan was able to confront God face to face. At this point, he has now morphed into a powerful, independent villain. And put together an army of demonic soldiers to do his bidding. It is only in the New Testament where the devil has matured, has changed, uh, and transformed into God's enemy. The encounter between Christ and Satan is documented in the Gospels. The accounts of Christ's life written by his most devoted adherents. The temptation story in the Gospels is Jesus' ordeal to see if he's really got the right stuff to be the Son of God, to be the Messiah. Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. It is written that Satan follows him. The first temptation, he goes out to be tested and he encounters Satan in the wilderness. The wilderness is a testing place in the Bible. Christ's fasting leaves him weakened. And Satan sees this as his first opportunity to tempt God's son. He issues his first challenge. Commanding Jesus as the son of God to turn stones into food. Turn these stones into bread. Now that's an interesting temptation right in itself. You're up against deity here and uh, he won't do it to satisfy himself after 40 days of fasting. Jesus deflects Satan's provocation by quoting scripture. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. And Satan then asks Jesus if he would fling himself off the temple. He quotes Deuteronomy saying that angels will support you. And Jesus uh, quotes again Deuteronomy and says, you know, you shouldn't put the Lord your God to the test. As Satan continues to probe the possibility of Christ's weakness, he will summon the greatest temptation to win the soul of Christ. Finally, in the third temptation, Satan stops that, and he finally shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world and says, all right, all right, just pay me a little homage. Just bow down a little bit, give me a little worship here, and you can have it all. Would Jesus sell his soul to the devil in exchange for all the power, all the glory of this world? Jesus resisted Satan's temptations, proving to many he was the long-awaited Messiah. By directly taking on Jesus, and therefore God, Satan had intensified their fight. The stakes had been pushed higher than ever before. In his preaching, Christ began to warn of the violent apocalyptic clash to come. He built much of his teaching on an end of days scenario. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he's talking to them, he says, there's people standing here this day that will not taste death before the coming of the kingdom. He believed that that end time was gonna be either in his lifetime or in the lifetime of his followers. Jesus himself laid out many of the signs by which his followers would recognize the coming of the final days. One of the things that he was preaching was that the kingdom of God is at hand. An apocalyptic connotation that it is promising a drastic change in the whole order of things. 
To Christians, he was referring to the end of days and the final defeat of Satan. In a lecture called the Olivet Discourse, he prophesied a time of great tribulation for his people. Jerusalem, God's holy city, would be surrounded by foreign armies, its residents taken prisoner and killed, and the holy temple destroyed, with not a single stone left standing. Christ told his followers they would be persecuted and false prophets would emerge. There would be wars, famine, and earthquakes. But the suffering would not compare with what was to come. To his followers, it may have seemed that signs of Satan abounded in first century Jerusalem under Roman rule. ruthlessness of the emperor and the debauchery of his people. Pagan Roman society, the good life yeah, that was available to a citizen of Rome, it was a place of tremendous cultural richness, art, theater, statuary, uh, drama, the, the games of the circus, all of these things were looked on as corruptions. Romans perceived Christ's prophecies of change and a new kingdom as a threat to their rule. They decided Jesus had to be stopped. The Romans thought of Jesus as a traitor to Rome and one who was a dangerous man, and that's why he was crucified. According to the New Testament, to help identify the man to be crucified, the Romans centurions bribed Judas, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. But the texts indicate that Judas may not have been to blame for his treachery. There is a reference to Satan entering into Judas which would suggest that Judas's betrayal of Jesus, which led to his arrest and torture and crucifixion, was a satanic plot. To the followers of Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus seemed to mark a zenith in the battle between God and Satan. Jesus himself predicted the end would be marked by a period of chaos and suffering. Had it arrived? Jesus came to earth to be the king of Israel. He didn't. He failed. He was crucified. He was totally defeated. How do you explain that? Christians, Jesus Christ was the long-awaited Messiah. God's earthly emissary heralding the kingdom of heaven. The New Testament shows Satan setting his sights on Jesus. But despite the greatest temptations, Satan was no match for the divine power. Many of the followers of Jesus believed that since Satan couldn't have Christ's worship, he had sought to bring about his death. The power of evil was aware of who Jesus was and who he was meant to be in God's scheme of things and, and was aiming for him. And the Gospel of Luke and, and John say, well, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, and it was Satan who instigated the death of Jesus. Christians believe Satan's indwelling of Judas enabled the Christ's crucifixion. And dealt God a fatal blow. 
Satan's victory was short-lived. Three days after Christ's death, his followers tell of entering his tomb. Jesus was thought to be raised from the dead and taken up to heaven. Christians were awed by the resurrection and set out to spread the story. Their excitement soon gave way to terror. Christians faced increasing persecution for their beliefs. Christ's triumph over Satan didn't turn out to be the earthly vindication that they might have hoped for. One of those followers documented his own idea of that future. Violent events that would signal Christ's return and the final clash with Satan. These biblical writings of the coming end of days are known to the world as the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation is one of the strangest books in the Bible. It doesn't have any ethics, it doesn't have any wisdom sayings, it doesn't have any poetry. It really consists of dreams and nightmares, of visions. The recipient of these visions is John of Patmos. The devout author is likely to have written his end of days saga sometime around 70 AD. While in exile, a refugee from war-torn Jerusalem. The Apocalypse of John, as the book is also known, unveils for the first time the prophecy of a final battle between God and Satan. It says God will address the wrongs of Satan. God is going to come back and avenge his people, his nation, his holy place. And he will do that when Jesus, his Messiah, returns with all the armies of heaven. The writings of John combine the signs found in Judaic texts with Christ's end of days prophecies to warn of the wrath that would engulf the earth and help mankind prepare to survive Satan at the height of his powers. Uh, the book of Revelation is one of the most uh, vivid in its imagery uh, in representing this, this cosmic conflict uh, between good and evil. The book begins with God on his throne in heaven. Next to the throne is a scroll, secured with seven seals. Seven being a holy number in Hebrew tradition. To unlock the scrolls, the angel must find someone worthy. There's another image of Jesus, apparently, and that is the slaughtered lamb with eyes all over it. It's a very weird and kind of grotesque image. But it says because the lamb has been slain, the lamb is worthy to receive the book and open the seals and speak the prophecies about what will happen. The prophecy unfolds with similarly bizarre images. Omens of the coming battle. breaking of the seven seals is the occasion for a series of what we would understand to be natural disasters or cataclysms that will be brought to earth by God at the end of days. A new violent scenario unfolds as each seal is broken. You see a whole series of heavenly visions, beginning with the four horsemen of the apocalypse.
all of them come emerging with agonies that are going to come onto the earth. A red horse brings war. A black horse brings famine. And a green horse brings death. The faithful believe the white foretells of an evil leader coming in the future. An accomplice of Satan. The rider on the white horse plunges the world into war. The conqueror that is coming in the future. Breaking of the fifth seal sees Christian martyrs gathering at the throne of God, asking him to avenge the wrongs wrought by Satan throughout human history. And they're the people who've been killed, slaughtered because of their faith in Jesus. And they say, Lord, how long? How long is it going to be before you avenge our blood on earth? The breaking of the sixth and seventh seals brings terrible cataclysms. Hail rains down from the heavens, scorching a third of the earth. Burning mountains are thrown into the sea, which turns red. A star falls and turns a third of the fresh waters bitter. A third of the sun, stars and moon turn black. The waters of the earth uh, turn to blood, uh, as of the blood of dead men. Insects emerge from the earth. The, the cosmos itself uh, is in chaos. God's wrath has only just begun. Next, he will send seven angels, and as each sounds his trumpet, they unleash new torments. They are followed by seven angels carrying seven bowls that contain a new set of horrors for humankind. The seventh bowl causes a final earthquake, the largest ever felt. world will be in chaos and the faithful will recognize these signs as the approach of the end of days. The apocalyptic visions of the Jewish texts coupled with the dark omens of revelation describe the coming battle. They also became a basis for the Islamic vision of the end days. We Muslims believe that there will be many battles and many disasters, uh, probably disasters uh, as the scale of world uh, wars. There will be struggle as it had been for thousands of years, struggle between evil powers and good powers. In early Islam, the, the earliest writings, the earliest years of Islam, there was, a, in fact, a strong apocalyptic strain that one finds in the Quran that echoes passages from the book of Revelation. Revelation's horrifying events do not only describe cataclysms in nature, its most terrifying chapter reveals Satan's evil plan in preparation for Armageddon. Satan will bring forth his own earthly emissaries, as God had with Jesus. Revelation portrays a snake-like dragon standing on the shore of the sea. Satan in Revelation is a red serpent uh, with seven heads and ten horns. And lest we mistake who this serpent is, this is the old serpent that tempted Eve. The same uh, devil that appears in the Hebrew Bible is carried forward into the book of Revelation. The devil summons two beasts, one from the sea and one from the earth. These are the accomplices of Satan 
who will do his evil work on earth in the final days. The beast from the earth is the false prophet, and the beast from the sea is the Antichrist. The lawless one that shall come in the future. Uh, John, in his letters, calls him Antichristos, anti-against Christ. And the beast out of the earth is the false religious leader. And you have a kind of almost a trinity of evil. The visions bring to life a period of bloody chaos that Christ himself had prophesied as a time of tribulation. The book of Revelations says that Satan's evil team will do all in its power to win over men's souls and build an army for the coming battle. The Christians believe they will be spectators to the tribulation. And I think what you have in the book of Revelation is how Jesus would come again and do the job right the next time. The question is, just who is subject to God's wrath? The book of Revelation predicts a terrifying prelude to the final battle between God and Satan. This section of the New Testament describes a seven-year period of tribulation for humanity and the omens that will signal its arrival. God's messengers will deliver his wrath upon the earth and diabolical beasts will emerge from the chaos. Controlled by Satan himself, these beasts will take human form and help bring about Armageddon. Will God let mankind suffer these agonies? Some Christians believe they will be spared. There's a great deal of suffering in this book, but Christians today debate whether God's people will have to endure it or not. Some Christians claim that those who belong to God will be taken out of the world before the seven years of the most intense suffering. Some Christians believe that God's people will be raptured, whisked away to reside with God, leaving the global mayhem and the tribulation period behind. The idea of the rapture has been deciphered from translations of the New Testament through the ages. The word itself emanates from a single verse from St. Paul's letters in the biblical book known as Thessalonians. The Greek text uses the term harpazo, which uh, means snatched away, caught away, zap, you're out of here. When the Bible was translated from Greek into Latin, the word became rapti, and in English it became rapture. It is a powerful idea that has seized the popular imagination. All believers are going to be taken up Billions of people will be snatched up and meet the Lord in the air. In it, cars will crash. Planes will come hurtling to the ground. And none of God's people will be left to suffer Satan's domination. This idea solves the problem of Revelation for the true believer who feels that they do not merit the terrible suffering that the, the book of Revelation seems to promise. They cling to the idea that they will magically disappear off the face of the earth before the real suffering begins. The prophecy forewarns Satan will use his emissaries to recruit human soldiers for the coming battle. As it's described in the book of Revelation, this is a time of intense worldwide conflict and chaos uh, that the world has never seen. 
need for somebody to step in and bring order out of chaos, a world leader figure. The book of Revelation calls him the beast. Uh, John in his letters called him the Antichrist. The beasts that emerge in Revelation are Satan's henchmen. The beast from the sea is the vision of an Antichrist, a man who will come in the form of a political leader. In the beginning, the Antichrist will appear a benign figure in order to gain power. And then all of a sudden, a person steps on the scene and says, you know what, we, we've got to come together. We, there has to be world peace. I've got a plan. Follow me. And the Bible says the whole world follows after him. This embodiment of evil called the Antichrist. The Antichrist is helped by another beast. The beast from the earth will be a religious leader who will aid the Antichrist in luring souls to the dark side. The beast out of the earth, who is later clearly called the false prophet, who causes the world to worship the beast. The Antichrist will become more power hungry and more evil, establishing a single world government and single world religion. So in the book of Revelation, Satan is the center of the evil influence behind the scenes of what is going on in the world and is being played out through the activity of the beast and the false prophet. Satan's followers, according to the Bible, will be branded with the mark of the beast. The marking 666 will identify those who will be commanded by Satan's lieutenant, the Antichrist those that believe in him, that choose him instead of Jesus Christ, will receive the mark on the back of their hand or on their forehead. They'll have this mark that distinguishes them as a believer of Antichrist, but really they're believing in Satan, and they worship Satan, and those who reject will often be killed. Historically, the mark 666 has been viewed as an early Christian cipher, symbolic of the oppression of the Romans and their emperors. The alphabets of the ancient world were used as numbers as well as letters, and so you could uh, create an alphanumeric code. If you then translated those numbers back into letters, you got the name of a Roman emperor. But most commonly it's read, of course, as the name of the Emperor Nero, who was said to be the first to persecute the Christians. Satan is said to draw the battle with God closer by inhabiting the Antichrist and demanding the loyalty of man. He will be indwelled by Satan himself and he will be the embodiment of evil and he'll have people worship him. Every human being during that tribulation period will have an opportunity to make their choice, Satan or God. So as Satan gathers his recruits, the cataclysmic events described in Revelation would continue to unfold. Literally all hell breaks loose on planet Earth in the time of tribulation. And the book of Revelation very clearly is predicting a great war in the future. The final act of provocation in Revelation says the Antichrist will enter Jerusalem and declare himself God, marking the time for the final battle at a place called Armageddon. To many, the word Armageddon has come to mean a final clash between good and evil. Is in fact an ancient battlefield in the Holy Land. And the location where it's believed this final clash will take place. The Hebrew name is Har Megiddo. The name Armageddon only appears one time in the Bible. Har Megiddon, the mountain of Megiddo. The battle will literally take place there at Armageddon. Satan and his armies will meet God on this plain at the base of Mount Megiddo. This fortress city, 
at the crossroads of ancient trade routes leading to Jerusalem. Har Megiddo emerged around 3500 BC and witnessed many battles that determine the faith of the land. This is a fertile valley in which you could line up chariots in ancient times, tanks in modern times, uh, to have such a battle. It's the ideal place to fight a battle in any generation, especially in the end times. The book of Revelation culminates the Antichrist uh, gathers his human armies. He's ruled the world. He's forced all people to worship him. Uh, he brings his armies to Megiddo, and they're preparing to do battle. It is believed they will have arrived at that fateful moment, one that will determine the fate of men's souls once and for all. With Satan's battle cry, God readies his forces. Satan has always desired the worship of humankind. Well, the bottom line is that's really what Armageddon is all about. It finally comes down to an ultimate showdown where Satan says, okay, it's me or you. A final cataclysmic battle between the armies of God and the armies of Satan. States, Christ predicts a time of tribulation, one plagued by disasters and cataclysms, and ruled by a satanic leader, the Antichrist. The book of Revelation says that the suffering and chaos will eventually reach its peak. Satan is trying to oppress them. He knows his time is short. He knows he doesn't have much time to, to do it. So he intensifies his fight. The devil will have lured worshippers to his side. And together, they will march as an army to defend his evil realm at the battlefield of Armageddon. The world is in chaos. It is as though God lets mankind push himself right to the edge of extinction and destruction before Christ returns to stop all of this and to intervene. And Jesus returns literally to rescue the world. For believers, it will be an ecstatic moment of prophecy fulfilled. That is really the battle, the supernatural cosmic battle it's easy to understand why it has gripped uh, the imagination of so many people so, so strongly. The book of Revelation says the Son of God, Jesus Christ, returns to purge the earth of Satan and his dark army by waging a cosmic battle to determine who will reign. Jesus descends from heaven to earth, rides into battle on a charger, a war horse, wears a mantle stained with blood. He, he looks like a knight in shining armor going forth to battle in the most literal possible way. It is believed that Satan and his army will be prepared for the battle. But the evil one doesn't know is that Jesus is now a warrior king wielding a most powerful weapon, the Word of God. Revelation describes Christ leading the charge, wielding a sword from his mouth. The imagery of the sword coming out of his mouth comes from the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that says that the Messiah will kill his enemies with the word of his mouth. And some people say, so he isn't going to be violent, it's only his word. But he's killing them. They're going to be dead. The 
because he just speaks the word and it's over. The final triumphant vision is not Jesus, the kind and gentle figure of the gospel. He is a punishing, vengeful, bloodthirsty figure who takes lives by the countless thousands such that blood runs in the street. When the dust settles, the word of God has slain Satan's human army. The angels invite the vultures to come and, f and to the great feast of God. And what's served for dinner are the corpses of all the slain, the captains, the kings, the armies, and the horses, which are thousands dead on the battlefield. While the evil human armies have been destroyed, Satan and his emissaries remain. The trinity of evil have survived to face God's wrath. Christ and the saints destroy the beast and his human armies. The Bible says he takes the beast and the false prophet, casts them alive into the lake of fire. While the Antichrist and false prophet are cast into hell, God has a different plan for Satan. And after that, Christ comes and chains Satan for a thousand years. The beast is bound, uh, he is held uh, for a thousand years while Christ establishes a, a kingdom of peace and righteousness and justice on earth. In Revelation, Satan is thrown into an abyss. His final defeat heralds God's millennial Christian kingdom on earth. With Jerusalem as the capital, those who chose the side of God will live in a utopian Christian kingdom. But the prophecy does not end there. Satan is defeated at Armageddon, but he's not finally out of the game until the end of the entire drama. Satan turns out to be a difficult enemy to defeat. The book of Revelation foretells God's bloody victory at the Battle of Armageddon. slain Satan's dark army and his evil emissaries the Antichrist and the false prophet will burn for eternity in the lake of fire the once powerful Satan is overcome by Christ himself he is chained and thrown into a great abyss for a thousand years where he can tempt man no longer for some Christians the victory at Armageddon will usher in an era foretold by ancient texts. The Messiah's reign as an earthly king. The idea that there would be a triumphant messianic kingdom on earth is in Jewish tradition. That idea is carried forward into the book of Revelation. When Jesus returns to earth as a conquering warrior, he will in fact reign over an earthly kingdom for a thousand years. More whole men and women will see Jesus as the king on earth. The difference will be they won't have Satan trying to deceive them. He will be, bare, be, be kept in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. The period of Christ's reign will result in a utopian kingdom. It is written that this peaceful era must come to an end, and evil will make a final appearance. And it's only at the end of this thousand-year reign of Jesus that uh, the, the final battle against Satan will be fought, according to the text, is his second and final battle. Satan's chained confinement has not weakened him, and it is said he will escape to tempt humanity one last time. When he's released, 
He certainly hasn't repented. He tries one last revolt. Yet Satan remains no match for God. In Revelations, God's final judgment of Satan relegates him to the lake of burning sulfur, where he will be tormented day and night forever in hell. Greek mythology referred to their underworld as Hades. And the ancient Jews spoke of Shoal, the abode of the dead. For Christians, the netherworld would be a fiery place of torment, well suited to be Satan's domain. We're talking about the end of time, period. The ultimate end of time as we know it will be with the final defeating of Satan. He's being cast, the Bible says, into eternal lake of fire. And the Bible then speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. It's, it's eternity. The world will be destroyed and the new heaven and the new earth will be created. The New Testament says that as God issues Satan's final judgment, the world itself is ready to be judged. This is believed to be the true end of days. The universe's final destruction. God is said to sit on his throne and open the books in which the deeds of all humanity have been recorded. This is the day of final judgment. Those in heaven and those in hell will appear before God for one last day of reckoning. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all believe in a final accounting. When every human who has ever lived will stand before God and learn where he or she is to spend eternity. We find many similarities in their scenario of the end of the world. They all believe in the day of judgment and the resurrection. One of the threads that runs continuously through the Abrahamic religions is precisely this expectation of the coming of a Messiah, the end of days, the day of judgment. And each of these three religions in its own way has interpreted and understood this same idea. For over 2,000 years, generation after generation have pondered the question, will the events foretold in the ancient texts come true? There are an infinite number of interpretations and meanings that could be attributed to these spooky images that we find in the text itself. In every age, uh, men and women look around themselves, look at the terrible things that happen in the world, natural disasters, war, revolution, famine, and identify them as uh, auguries of the imminent end. While each religion interprets the end differently, the battle between good and evil lies at the core of each religious tradition. And in every age, Humanity prays for an end to evil. I think that the apocalyptic literature appeals to modern people for the same reasons that it appealed to people during biblical antiquity. And that is, they want to know that, that God is fighting for them, and in the end, good will triumph over evil. From the early Judaic prophecies to Christ's own preaching to the modern day interpretation of the book of Revelation, believers through the ages have awaited the kingdom of God and looked for the signs that the end of days are upon them. Yes, 